Last lecture, we started our skeletal muscle lecture, and I chose a few slides just to review exactly what we covered. And then following those review slides, we'll go through regulation of muscle contraction. Now, remember, there are three different types of muscle in animals. Cardiac, skeletal, smooth, cardiac, and skeletal have similar uh, repeated contractile units that ultimately allow for massive shortening and also powerful contraction of those types of muscles. Smooth muscle is very different as far as its contractile property. Remember when we look at skeletal muscle, they're comprised of really large muscle fibers or what we call muscle cells and ultimately they're stuffed or filled with myofibrils that contain repeated contractile units called sarcomeres. These sarcomeres consist of thin and thick filaments. The thin filaments are actin, and the thick filaments are myosin motor proteins. And ultimately, the striated nature of skeletal muscle is due to the skeletal muscle being comprised of these repeated sarcomere units that are going to contract and shorten the muscle. If we were to look at the sarcomere structure and the contraction process, these motor heads walk towards the end of the actin, which is connected to Z discs. And when they walk towards these Z discs, they essentially will shorten the sarcomere. And the approximate shortening is, remember, um, going from something like 3 to 1.5 micrometers in length. Myosin walks on actin due to the binding and hydrolysis of ATP. Hydrolysis of ATP leads to different conformational states that allow for mechanical motion of the motor heads. So keep in mind there are approximately 300 motors in a thick filament, and all these motor heads are going to be at different states in the hydrolysis cycle, and ultimately that will lead to walking or movement of those myosin motors over the actin filaments, drawing the sarcomere disc closer together, which shortens the sarcomere length. So on the right-hand side, you'll see the hydrolysis cycle of the motor heads that lead to that stepping motion. So the first, as a review, the first step is in the absence of ATP, the motor is bound to the actin in what's called rigor mortis state or in the power stroke motion. And binding of ATP to the motor head releases the actin. Hydrolysis of ATP leads to movement of the motor head forward but not contacting the actin and release of the inorganic phosphate group leads to now a higher affinity binding so it leads to binding a step forward. And then loss of ADP then sets the motor up for the next stepping motion so it sets it up into what's called the power stroke meaning it's set later to swing forward once it receives another hydrolysis cycle of ATP. Each one of these motors are going to be independently doing this and potentially allow for that movement forward. Now, this particular slide was the one I showed you last lecture that really highlights that same stepping motion but showing you that one step forward after a complete ATP hydrolysis cycle for a motor head. Keep in mind, there are going to be multiple motor heads doing this at the same time or at different states of the ATP, ATP cycle but essentially walking to allow for that sliding movement of the sarcomere, meaning that movement, that rapid movement in of those Z discs which shorten the sarcomere. So how is this process regulated? Obviously our sarcomeres are not continually shortening. We want to control this process. And control of this process ultimately involves certain proteins that actually bind to the actin filaments to where the myosin motors may not actually be able to bind until movement of these proteins occur. So actin filaments have an important complex that lies across the actin filaments and depending on the positioning of this complex it either allows the motor heads to bind or not. This complex is called the tropomyosin complex and the tropomyosin contains a troponin complex associated with the tropomyosin complex. Tropo tropomyosin is a long filamentous protein and it wraps itself around the actual binding sites for myosin and can cover them.
In the absence of calcium, tropomyosin covers the binding sites for the motor heads, therefore preventing myosin from actually interacting with the actin, and then it prevents the myosin from motoring and shortening the sarcomeres. So if contraction is not supposed to occur, it will block those sites and then essentially prevent myosin from motoring and shortening of your, of your skeletal muscle. However, if calcium is released, calcium will bind to troponin, which interacts with tropomyosin, and then troponin will cause tropomyosin to move off the binding sites for myosin. You can see now the binding sites which are shown in as brown spots are now available and the motorheads can now instantly bind hydrolyze ATP and shorten the sarcomere by walking on actin filaments. So tropomyosin and troponin are an important regulatory complex that's on the actin that will interfere with binding of myosin but however in the presence of calcium they'll be moved out of the way so that motors can essentially bind and shorten the sarcomeres. What allows for ultimately calcium to interact with this complex? Well, calcium ultimately is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the muscle cells are built in such a way that they have sarcoplasmic reticulum that wraps all around the myofibrils, as you can see in this particular diagram. So if calcium is released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it will flood into the myofibrils, into the sarcomeres, so that it can then bind to troponin and help move tropomyosin off of the myosin binding sites. In addition to having this sarcoplasmic reticulum that wraps around the fibrils so that it can release calcium right into those myofibrils, we also have what are called transverse tubules, which are invaginated membrane tubes that stretch very near the sarcoplasmic reticulum and basically are derived from the plasma membrane. This will help deliver signaling to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then allow for release of calcium, which we'll see in a few minutes. Now, these, the calcium, when it's being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum so it can lead to bonding to troponin, is actually triggered by action potentials that enter into the transverse tubule, these invaginated tubes, and then it leads to opening of calcium channels, and calcium will then flow out of these sarcoplasmic reticulum into the cytoplasm of the muscle cell. And if we were to look at a greater um, larger diagram of this process, the signaling is ultimately going to come from motor neurons that intervene the skeletal muscle. So our nervous system is going to tell our skeletal muscle when it needs to contract, which you can see here. Remember that motor neurons release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will ultimately lead to binding to acetylcholine receptors on the muscle cell, and those receptors are sodium channels. The sodium will rush into the muscle cell and it will generate an action potential on the surface of the muscle cell and that action potential will then be propagated through the transverse tubules, those membrane tubes into the cell. So through these tubes. And that will then lead to opening of those calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then calcium will move out into the cytoplasm, interact with troponin, move tropomyosin off of the myosin binding sites and allow myosin to start to motor. This particular diagram shows exactly that. So here are these motor neurons that intervene our skeletal muscle fiber cells. And here is that release of acetylcholine. So an action potential will go down the motor neuron, lead to exocytosis of acetylcholine that's stored in vesicles at the end of the motor neuron. That acetylcholine will then bind to ligand-gated sodium channels. Sodium will rush into the cell through these channels, initiating an action potential in that muscle cell. The action potential will then move down the transverse tubule, and that will lead to opening of channels that are in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and calcium will move into the cytoplasm.
sur essentially surrounding those myofibrils. Calcium will then get picked up by troponin, and this will cause a conformational state change that moves tropomyosin off the binding sites, which you can see from this diagram, and now the motor heads are going to be able to bind and walk on the actin filaments, essentially shortening the sarcomere, which leads to skeletal muscle contraction. To relax the skeletal muscle, what has to happen is the calcium has to be returned to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And there are calcium pumps in the sarcoplasmic reticulum that are going to use ATP to concentrate calcium once again in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, remove it from the cytoplasm, and then ultimately with the absence of calcium from the cytoplasm, troponin won't be binding calcium anymore and it will then move tropomyosin back over the myosin binding sites and the motor heads will not be able to bind and then the skeletal muscle rela will relax, meaning the, the sarcomere will bounce back to its resting length of about 3 micrometers until the process starts over again. So that's how we'll get muscle relaxation. So ultimately muscle contraction is initiated by in, uh, by motor neurons that are going to ultimately lead to action potential generation in the muscle cell that will then be propagated across the, the surface of the plasma membrane down the transverse tubules and then ultimately lead to release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This will then move tro troponin, will bind to troponin, then move tropomyosin off the actin binding sites and the motor heads will motor, shorten your sarcomeres, and then removal of calcium will lead to relaxation of the muscle cells again. And this process will hope happen over and over again. So keep in mind, this skeletal muscle contraction is an extremely rapid process. In fact, depolarization of the membrane, which leads to action potential generation, is transmitted across the plasma membrane in down to the transverse tubules in milliseconds. And the actual shortening of the sarcomeres due to walking of the myosin motors is about 15 micrometers per second. So that sliding or movement of actin towards each other as the motor heads walk towards the Z discs is very rapid. In fact, the muscle will become fully contracted in one tenth of a second. And relaxation is also rapid and it occurs in approximately 30 milliseconds. So calcium is pumped very rapidly back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum to make calcium concentrations very low in the cytoplasm again so that there is no interaction with calcium with troponin and then the skeletal muscles will relax and this process happens very rapidly like I said 30 milliseconds which you know you're capable of moving your limbs very rapidly and movement of your limbs is going to require alteration, alternation between contraction plus relaxation. This contraction process is summarized in this web link. And this web link is actually the exact video that's posted for your Essential Cell Bio book. So you can also find this video on your Essential Cell website if you log in as a student. But here's a login that shows you the exact video that I would show you in class, which goes through the complete process of, of regulation of muscle contraction, stimulation by neuron, propagation of action potentials, and then opening of calcium channels and how ultimately the troponin and tropomyosin complex regulates the binding of myosin motors. So watch this video, watch it a few times, and it will ultimately help review the whole process. I would also recommend that you really draw a diagram going through all the steps of regulation of muscle contraction, starting with stimulation by the motor neuron, as well as all the way through binding of the my myosin motor heads and also write out the steps what leads to relaxation. Those steps and a diagram with it will be extremely important for your review process for the next exam.